Okay, dogs. I think we can make a start now that James Penner is here. <laughs> yeah. So today our speaker uh, is Matthew Harding, who is the professor of law and deputy at Melbourne Law School, the University of Melbourne, and his work lies in lots of different areas. So legal and moral philosophy, um, doctrines and theory of equity, one of my interests, um, property law, the law of charities as well as lots of others. <laughs> So I think this forms part of his work on charity law more broadly and today he's going to talk about independence and accountability for the charity sector. So I think Matthew will probably speak for about 13 minutes or so and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Great. Thank you Rachel um, and thanks for asking me to come and thanks for, for, to everyone for having me and uh, uh, for coming to the paper. Um, Rachel and I were talking just before um, we came down here and she asked me, well, what, what motivated you to want to write this? What lies behind this? And um, I thought, well, it might help if I say something about that before I talk to the paper itself. Um, so um, as, as Rachel said, I've been working on charity law for some time now. Um, and a few years back, uh, I wrote a book in which I tried to defend from a certain liberal standpoint uh, the, the sort of project that underpins charity law as a body of law uh, that marks out certain types of purpose as charitable and then um, promotes and incentivizes uh, their pursuit in certain ways. Um, and the book that I ended up writing, um, looked at that and um, put the argument that that, was, um, that project was broadly defensible uh, from a liberal point of view. Um, the book uh, attracted some uh, criticism, including from James, who's here, uh, who kindly came to Melbourne and did me the honour of um, ripping into me <laughs> in the kindest possible way. Um, but, but that criticism got me uh, thinking along the lines that have led me to this paper today. Because one of the things that I uh, began to think about in light of what people said about the book and what I was trying to do in the book, one of the things that I began to think about is, well, um, is, there another, um, is there another project here to sit alongside the one that I was trying to carry out in that book? a project of trying to identify um, uh, certain purposes and activities that we want brought within the scope of this charity law project, uh, purposes and activities that we want the charity sector to be um, engaged in with the, the supports of the state. Uh, is, is there a division of, of labour between those purposes and activities being performed by charities on the one hand and what we might want the state to do without the involvement of charities. And um, there's obviously quite a lot written on um, this question of what the state should have the burden of doing and what we uh, want charities to be doing. But what I've found is that a lot of that literature focuses on um, uh, why it's good for the state to assume certain burdens because of characteristics of the state itself, because of its scale and, and reach, because of its resources, um, because of its monopoly on legitimate coercion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I saw less on in the work that I read uh, was why we might want the charity sector not to carry certain burdens for the sake of the charity sector itself. Um, or to put this another way, what costs might be occasioned to the charity sector in a world where it's being asked to do a whole lot of stuff that the state might just as easily do without the involvement of charities. So that's kind of where my thinking, my research and my, my thinking led me to, and that's one of the motivations for writing this paper. But there's another um, motivation as well. Um, in Australia, 
in New Zealand, in England and Wales, in Canada, in the United States. Uh, there's been a lot of activity in recent years uh, relating to charities, uh, activity on the legal front, on the regulatory front, and on the political front. Um, I'm less familiar with the situation in Singapore, though Rachel's been illuminating me uh, on where matters stand here. But from an Australian standpoint, for example, we've seen uh, a lot of legislative reform to the law of charities, to the law defining charities, to the tax laws that um, attach to and are triggered by um, the status of charity uh, and to the regulatory framework that um, charity governance operates within. Um, and uh, that legal change has entailed the state both seeking to impose restrictions and controls on charities in some respects and releasing them in others. And I, I think that's been interesting. And, and then when you look to the other jurisdictions, England and Wales, you see exactly the same thing happen. You see a parliament enacting a statute that in some respects seeks to uh, restrict and control and in other respects relaxes the levers a bit. And again, uh, you see it in New Zealand and elsewhere. So these legal changes um, stand to be evaluated and thought through in some way. And so that's something that uh, I'm trying to do here in the paper. Regulatory changes um, in some ways have been more striking than the, the sort of law that's been enacted um, uh, in the jurisdictions that I'm familiar with. Um, in Australia, for example, um, we have a, a Charities Commission. Uh, a new commissioner was appointed uh, two years ago, I think it is. Uh, he has very particular idiosyncratic views about what the charity sector ought to be doing. He has extensive powers and he fully intends to use them uh, to uh, bring uh, the activities and purposes of charities into alignment with his views. In an ideal world, he'll be prosecuting cases in appellate courts. He doesn't have the funding to do it, but as soon as he gets that funding, we'll be getting the litigation. So there too, you see exactly the same thing. You see, in this case, it's a regulator. It's, it's a, a, an office holder in the executive government seeking to exert control over charities. And then the political changes uh, have, have interested me. Here, I think the, the really, um, the, the most striking uh, uh, changes uh, that we see in, in, in countries like Australia and New Zealand and Canada uh, relate to um, uh, political advocacy by charities, uh, whether as a purpose or in pursuit of their charitable purposes. And in, the, in these jurisdictions, we've seen governments um, seeking uh, by political means and legal means and regulatory means to put pressure on charities to be silent about um, matters of government policy, for example, uh, and to, in the words of one of the British ministers um, um, of a few years back, uh, get charities to stick to their knitting. <laughs> so, so all of this stuff, has been uh, much in my mind in the last few years and it also, in addition to the intellectual interest, this more political agenda is uh, lying beneath this paper. So, the question that the paper looks at is a pretty basic one and one that's, as I say, been traversed pretty often but uh, I'm trying to turn it over from slightly new angles. Um, to what extent should a charity sector be independent of the state and to what extent should it be accountable to the state? Um, now, what I do in the paper is I, um, I start by trying to get a, a better understanding of why we might care about having a charity sector that is independent of the state. Why would this be something that we worry over? We think it's important. Why do we think it's important? And um, in part two of the paper, I try to provide some arguments that appeal to what I take as fundamental liberal values. Um, diversity and uh, voluntarism. Uh, you might as well uh, think of that as autonomy, um, uh, if the word voluntarism grates. 
and I, I tried to work up some arguments for why we would want the charity sector to be independent of the state in light of those values. Um, then in the third part of the paper, I, I try to identify different types of charity accountability to the state. Um, and I talk about, on the, uh, in the first place, what I call constitutive accountability. It's the accountability that charities have to the state at the point where they are constituted as charities. Uh, I then have a look at what I call stakeholder accountability, the accountability that charities owe when they're dealing with the state as a stakeholder, and that would typically be when the state enters into a contract with a charity, say, to fund the provision of services. And then finally, um, I look at what I call governance accountability, uh, the accountability of managers and controllers of charities um, to apply charitable assets only to the purposes for which they have been um, placed on charity, on trust, if you like. And I, I have a look at those three types of accountability and, and try to get a sense of where we might worry that there's state overreach in light of the values of diversity and voluntarism. So if I turn then to those values, um, if we start with diversity, you often see in literature on charities um, an appeal to the value of diversity as something that's, um, that's um, valuable about um, an independent charity sector. Um, in the paper, I talk about how there certainly is a diversity of um, purposes pursued in the charity sector, and that's reflected in charity law itself, which has always recognised multiple purpose types as charitable. Um, we also see uh, recognition of the diversity uh, within the charity sector through charity law's public benefit test. Um, according to that test, um, purposes to be charitable must be demonstrated to be a public benefit. Um, decision makers are always willing to uh, recognise diverse values or diverse goods when they're operating that public benefit jurisprudence, that test. Uh, there's no suggestion that you'd need to reduce um, questions of public benefit to a sort of um, utilitarian analysis or a cost benefit analysis that economists might be comfortable with. Um, pluralism and diversity is um, sort of the bread and butter of um, the public benefit uh, jurisprudence. Um, but in the paper, um, I do point out that um, just because the pursuit of charitable purposes generates a multiplicity of goods doesn't by itself establish any um, strong argument for the independence of the charity sector from the state. Um, and that's because the state itself uh, and indeed the for-profit sector produce many of the same goods. Um, now, in some cases, uh, the charity sector produces goods that the state and the for-profit sector either can't or won't produce. So in a secular um, state, um, the state won't, uh, can't, perhaps for constitutional reasons, produce religious goods. Um, uh, in cases where goods are uh, non-excludable and non-rivalrous, true public goods, uh, the for-profit sector is unlikely to produce them because um, uh, it, it, it will be at odds with the profit motive. Uh, and so um, there are cases where the charity sector is kind of uniquely positioned to produce certain goods. Um, but when you look at what charities are doing across the board, in fact, the majority of cases are those in which charities are producing goods that are also being produced by either the state or the for-profit sector, or both healthcare, education, disability support, housing, the list goes on. So in those cases, we can't say that an independent charity sector is necessary or even important for those goods to be produced because without charities, they probably would still be produced. So plural goods doesn't get you where you need to go. Um, it gets you only part of the way. Um, so then I look at voluntarism, um, uh, the idea that the sector is a site for voluntary action. This is again, something that's often brought up uh, in certainly liberal accounts of why the charity sector is valuable. Um, it's a view that I think you can find in John Stuart Mill's work. Um, this idea that um, 
that social structures uh, are, are necessary so that people can um, self-develop uh, and associate freely to pursue their chosen purposes. And this is especially the case with the purposes of uh, counter-majoritarian, where they won't get the sort of political traction uh, if the state tries to pursue them. So if there's some sort of special value in the voluntary production of plural goods, then there seems to be a distinctive role for charity sector that's independent of the state, at least to the extent that this, the, the state is a site for coercion rather than voluntarism. And, and I suppose that's not something we can just assume um, in all cases. But again, um, while the fact that the charity sector is a site for voluntary action might help us to see why we would want a charity sector that's independent of the state, it's, it's not really, again, doing enough on its own because the for-profit sector is also a site for voluntary action. The family sector is a site for voluntary action. Uh, and people associate on a voluntary basis in those sectors too, even in the production of counter-majoritarian goods. So um, I think, um, Plural goods is part of the picture. Voluntarism is part of the picture, but those things don't get us where we need to be. Um, I then introduced the idea that um, in addition to plural goods and voluntarism, we need to focus on the distinctive means by which the, the charity sector brings about the outcomes that it brings about. So it's not just about the goods that get produced, not just about the principle of voluntarism that animates action in that sector, there's also something to be said about the means adopted, uh, how people go about doing what they do in the charity sector. And here, I think, again, charity law gives us some interesting guidance. Um, the, um, there are two propositions in charity law if, if, that, that are of interest here. Um, if your purpose is to produce profits or other goods for stakeholders um, or, um, or members, uh, then um, your organisation is not recognised as a charity. It's not public in the necessary sense. Um, where your purpose is to produce private goods, or goods for a private class, again, you, you won't be considered a charity, you won't have the necessary public character. And I think in these ways, charity law is um, uh, setting up uh, a framework in which people are um, incentivised to uh, adopt uh, altruistic means uh, for the generation of the goods that they produce. Um, it, it won't be enough to uh, do good things for the people you know, for the members of your club, for the members of your family, um, and so forth. It won't be enough to do good things for others in exchange for some benefit for yourself. Uh, what charity law is incentivizing you to do is to uh, help to assist, to benefit the other as such, without any reciprocity in that exchange. But then that doesn't help us to understand how diversity and voluntarism support an argument for the independence of the sector, because if everyone's being corralled by charity law into altruism as a, as a way of doing things, that seems to be narrowing the range of options in that sector, not expanding them. But there is still diversity there, I argue in the paper, because there are lots of different ways of being altruistic. Um, and there are many virtues that have the character of altruism about them. So justice would be one. The virtue of charity in a non-legal sense would be one. A sort of public spiritedness that, 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 might, um, uh, that might find expression in um, wanting to produce public goods for everyone to enjoy. That, that would seem to be an altruistic virtue as well. Mercy, I think, is an altruistic virtue. So um, here are different ways of being altruistic, all of which are enabled by um, charity law. Now, that seems to be something distinctive about the charity sector as such. And in the paper, I argue that we're less likely to see altruism as a principle of action uh, in state settings and in the for-profit sector than we are in the charity sector because charity law is structurally orienting people into being altruistic. And also I argue in the paper because of certain characteristics of the state, um, 
uh, that make it difficult for altruism to be successfully expressed, um, or at least make it difficult for the full range of altruistic virtues to be successfully expressed um, while acting within the framework of the state. So that's where I think the argument um, ends up. Uh, when you, when you put together the production of, voluntary go uh, of plural goods on a voluntary basis by a, a range of altruistic means that enable the expression of different virtues, then you start to get a, a picture of why we might care about the charity sector based on liberal values of diversity and voluntarism. And that's the, the, the picture that I then I bring into the next part of the paper when I start to look at the different ways in which the sector um, is accountable to the state. Am I done? Okay. Okay, so, so that's part three of the paper where I'm at now. And um, as I said earlier, there are three types of accountability that I take a look at. The first is what I call constitutive accountability. Um, this is the accountability of charities to the state at the point where they are trying to show the state that they are charities, at the point of being constituted as charities, recognised as such by the state. Um, and uh, the key um, uh, vehicle for accountability here is charity law um, and the um, requirement that um, charitable purposes fall within established heads of charity uh, the public benefit requirement uh, and other rules that knock certain purpose types out of the picture as charitable purpose types. And I'm thinking, for example, of the rule uh, from Bowman's case that says that um, purposes of um, engaging in law reform or political advocacy can't be charitable purposes. So in all these ways, the state through its law is um, uh, basically saying to people who want to associate to produce goods on a voluntary basis, um, you go ahead and do that. But if you want to be a charity, you have to confine yourself to these purposes. Uh, and um, if you want to be a charity, you have to leave behind these others that do not get recognised in the law. Um, now, the interesting thing that we see if we look around the world at the moment is that We've gone from, as I said earlier, we've gone from a position where there's been a relatively unified approach to this question of constitutive accountability across the common law world until about 15 years ago when diversity starts to emerge across the common law world as a result of legislative change in different jurisdictions. So, for example, I think it's arguably the case now that uh, constitutive accountability is more rigorous in England and Wales than it is in Australia. And the reason for that is that in 2006, in England and Wales, uh, the uh, parliament enacted uh, a statutory provision that said that in no case could a decision maker uh, presume that the purpose of an organisation was of public benefit when working out whether they're a charity. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether that provision actually means anything, but the upshot of it is that everyone now thinks you have to be rigorous about public benefit in England and Wales in a way you didn't have to before. It's harder to get into the charity tent now as a result of that in England and Wales. In Australia, on the other hand, in 2013, the Parliament enacted a, a statutory provision that said in the case of certain purpose types, which extend beyond what anyone had thought before, in the case of certain purpose types, uh, public benefit will be presumed. So Australia has gone the other way, making it easier to get into the charity tent than it used to be. So we've got England becoming more rigorous and Australia becoming more accommodating at roughly the same time. Um, and again, if we look at the fate of the Bowman rule against political purposes across the common law world, we see some very interesting developments. We have a relatively accommodating approach in Australia, thanks to a High Court decision from 10 or so, 10 or so years ago. We have uh, a more rigorous approach in Canada. Uh, and we have what on its face looks like an accommodating approach in New Zealand after a Supreme Court decision um, a few years ago in a case involving Greenpeace, 
But that turns out actually, when you look at it more closely, to be just as rigorous as, as the old rule in Bowman ever was. So you've got again divergence across the common law world. So I guess the question we ask ourselves is: just, Should any of this be of concern? Um, should these moves towards greater restriction in the jurisdictions where we see it? Should we be resisting this because it's interfering with the independence of the sector, because it's interfering with values of diversity and voluntarism? Um, interestingly, um, one sort of um, uh, one clear statement of this anxiety about constitutive accountability being a problem comes from um, one of the leading uh, decisions of the US Supreme Court in charity law. Bob Jones University case, um, where you have a, a private university that has a racially discriminatory admissions policy. And the question is, does that disqualify it from being a charity so that it loses its tax exemption? And the US Supreme Court says, yes, it does, on the basis that you can't have a racially discriminatory admissions policy and be of public benefit in accordance with fundamental public policy in the US. And Justice Powell agrees with that, but he does say along the way that he's very worried about this public benefit test in charity law. And he says he, he, he thinks that the test seems to assume that the proper function of charities is, quote, to act on behalf of the government in carrying out governmentally approved policies. So is this something that we need to worry over, especially where we see charity law being becoming more rigorous as it is in England and Wales, for example. Um, in the paper, I argue that we probably shouldn't be so worried. Um, and there are a few considerations behind that. Um, one is that um, there are a lot of different purpose types that are recognised as charitable in law, even if in some respects um, in some jurisdictions, certain purposes and even certain purpose types are now ruled out where they once weren't. There's plenty left over. Um, in any event, you can carry out all the purposes you like, so long as they're not illegal or contrary to you know, the fundamental public policy that underpins other bodies of law. Um, if you don't want to be a charity, you're free to do whatever you like. It's only if you want the benefits of being a charity that you have to come into the charity tent. Um, and of course, we shouldn't forget that there's plenty of diversity and voluntarism in the for-profit sector. Um, and we shouldn't forget that plural goods continue to be produced in all sectors. Um, I think there might even be an argument that by keeping a tight rein on the definition of charity, the state um, promotes uh, diversity in certain ways by enabling altruistic action that isn't likely to flourish in other sectors. So by creating that structural incentive, you might actually be making a contribution to diversity. But I do think that we should be wary of state overreach in this area. And I give as an example of what I think might be state overreach, the reforms that led to the independent schools case in England and Wales. Um, and uh, I won't go into the details of that case now, but I'm happy to discuss it further if people want to talk about it later. Um, I might move on to stakeholder accountability. So here, what I'm really interested in are situations where the state either gives a grant to a charity uh, and then uh, expects uh, certain things from that charity in the grant acquittal process. Uh, and I'm also interested in cases which are now much more prevalent than they once were, certainly in a country like Australia, where the state uh, has divested itself of the responsibility to directly provide certain services to the public uh, and instead has a model of entering into contracts with charities under which the charity promises to provide the service and the state promises to provide the money uh, and the charity usually also has to promise a whole lot of other stuff too, like we will deliver these outcomes, uh, we will, um, the composition of our board will be like this, and you government are allowed to have someone on the board, um, we will report to you regularly along the way, and uh, certainly in Australia, um, in 
in, at certain times and um, even now, um, the, the additional promises might include, we will not um, embarrass you by making public statements about your policies, especially in the area in which we've provided the funding. So these are examples of governments as stakeholders clearly trying to control and monitor the goods that charities produce and the, the means by which those goods are produced. Now, I think there is cause for concern uh, in um, these developments in stakeholder accountability. Government funding is often tied, usually tied to government priorities and policies. Um, to the extent charities agree to take that funding on those terms, they're being corralled into focusing their energies on delivering goods that accord with government priorities. They are therefore, to that extent, not going to produce other goods that they might otherwise have produced. If you get too much of this, you're starting to see a situation where the pluralism, uh, or the plurality of goods that's produced in the charity sector might become might diminish, especially when the goods in question are um, counter-majoritarian. Um, I think volu voluntarism is also uh, at threat. Um, and I suppose on the one hand, you could say, well, charities don't have to take government money. They can always try and make it without it. But I wonder whether that's really the lived experience of people running charities. If you're committed to helping the poor and the landscape when it comes to helping the poor in your society is that uh, charities are expected to do this because the government's not doing it. And your options are you take government money and get on with the work of helping the poor with that money, or you just can't do that work realistically, um, then I wonder to what extent your actions are voluntary. Um, I also wonder whether the, um, the sort of control mechanisms that we see in contracts um, very frequently uh, narrow the means by which charities go about what they do. And in some of the academic literature, there has been some interesting discussion of some of this. Um, Deborah Morris's work in particular gives some good examples. Um, for example, um, uh, the government stipulating in a contract that a playgroup that's being now funded by government must open for longer hours and therefore employ full-time staff. But the whole point of setting up the playgroup was that it would provide employment for part-time employment for local women. So this sort of thing, I think we have to worry over. Uh, in the paper, I identify what these costs to voluntarism and diversity might be, and I then um, I suppose you should remind her that the world we have, at least in a country like Australia, where a lot of welfare and other social services are outsourced to the ch charity sector and funded by government, uh, that's not the only possible model for the delivery of these goods to the community. Um, uh, we shouldn't forget that the state could directly provide some of these goods as it once did, as it continues to do in other jurisdictions. Um, and I think this is what I'm saying in this paper about costs to the sector is one perspective on that bigger question of how much should the state be just doing the core business of delivering social welfare um, and how much should it be pushing on to the charity sector the work of doing that. All right, so I'll finish up with just a quick word on governance accountability. Um, so here, uh, the, the idea is, and, and this is probably the form of accountability that's sort of most readily understood um, by non-charity lawyers, but the, the idea here is that um, when people are um, uh, managing, controlling, entrusted with assets to be applied to charitable purposes, they need to be kept to their game, and uh, the state um, controls and constrains uh, the action of those um, managers and controllers uh, to ensure that charity assets are applied to the purposes for which they were dedicated and they're not diverted into the pockets of the people running the charity or stakeholders, um, are not wasted, not hoarded. Uh, there's lots of different ways in which this sort of accountability um, is expressed. 
obviously through fiduciary standards of governance, through company law, through the law governing other forms in which charities operate, um, through regulatory standards, and that's a big source of guidance and constraint in my own jurisdiction, Australia, um, through rules about accumulations, um, uh, through rules requiring that um, charity money only be expended within a certain territorial um, region. Um, so in Australia, there are rules in the tax law that um, effectively require charities to spend, uh, to carry out their purposes primarily in Australia. The idea being that we don't want those foreigners to benefit from our tax dollars being used to subsidise charity, etc. Et and in the paper, I, I, I draw a distinction between two um, objectives of governance accountability. Where you're looking at governance accountability that is directly about keeping charity controllers and trustees on their game, there's no cost there, on my view, to voluntarism. People sign up knowing that these are the, uh, the rules that um, require, or knowing that they are undertaking to apply charity assets to the purposes which they were dedicated. These rules support and bolster that undertaking. Um, the people who dedicate the assets to those purposes uh, have voluntarily done so on the understanding that that is how they'll be applied. These are mechanisms to buttress and support the voluntary choices of settlers, donors, and indeed managers and trustees themselves. Where governance accountability is um, serving an objective other than keeping charity trustees on their game, where we're trying to stop them from applying money to charitable purposes in one way or another way within um, certain jurisdictions where we're stopping them from accumulating too much, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then I think we're starting to enter the territory where we need to worry about uh, undue interference with voluntarism. And in the paper, I talk through a few examples of that, one being the, um, the uh, rule in the Canadian tax law that led to the recent Ontario decision in Canada without poverty. Basically, the tax authority uh, had a, a rule that required um, charities uh, to spend only a certain very small percentage of their income on political advocacy purposes in, or activities in any given year. Uh, that uh, rule, uh, the judge in the, in the Ontario um, Superior Court uh, said that the, the policy objective behind that rule was nothing more than to silence charities from doing too much political advocacy. It had nothing to do with keeping um, charitable assets supplied to charitable purposes, because you can engage in political advocacy in pursuit of charitable purposes. Uh, and uh, indeed, the rule was struck down as unconstitutional um, because it was interfering with uh, freedom of expression protected by the Canadian uh, Constitution. Okay. Um, so um, I'm happy to talk more about these more um, indirect means in which government's accountability um, finds expression. But I think I've probably said enough, so I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. Um, yeah.